Hello, I'm Charlie Brook and you're watching Gameswipe, a programme all about video games. Video games. Bleeping, blooping, masturbatory aids for emotionally crippled social outcasts. Probably male outcasts. Probably physically repugnant and sexually inexperienced. Probably frightened of the real world. Probably standing here on this very spot saying these very words to camera right now. Probably me. Basically, video games are for losers like me, apparently. Yeah, games have a bit of an image problem. It doesn't help that you rarely see games on TV, and when you do, they're often being discussed in searingly negative terms. In Grand Theft Auto, your son, or your husband, or your boyfriend, or whoever, can hire a prostitute, have sex with her, and then beat her to death with a baseball bat. Ever since the primitive early days of video gaming, TV has never really known how to convey the white-hot electronic thrill of the pixelated realm. Here's a brand new idea from the United States which can turn your television set into a game that two can play. All you have to do is uh, first of all to switch it off, unplug the aerial, plug in the electronic game simulator, switch on the set again, and now who's for tennis? Play. Fifteen love. Christmas looks fun round your house. Ah, uh, that was my point. Uh, 30 love. Again? Games steadily grew in complexity, first with eerie spectral shooters like Space Invaders, then with colourful characters like Pac-Man. But they were rarely seen on TV except in cheery 80s sitcom-style commercials for exciting-looking games starring familiar, albeit incongruous, faces. It's my Atari and it's my turn to play! Yes, because I'm winning. Give us luck! I suppose it was luck I beat you at Space Invaders. Defender, Yars Revenge. Some of us, Eric, are just that little bit quicker, sharper. When it wasn't accepting the mucky advertising dollar, however, TV was treating games with disapproving paternal disdain. Most games are developed from just a few classic themes. There's monster games like this one, where you run around bumping off critters or swallowing giant cherries. And there's the Space Invader theme, where you, move up, you shoot at moving fleets of hostile aliens. Fairly boring. And then there's the more recent sports games. Well, sports games to me are perhaps the most appalling use of computers. Christ, if you think that's an appalling use of computers, you don't want to look at my hard drive. British TV's disinterest in games throughout the 80s was particularly unfair considering there was a renaissance of homebrew programming going on. Thanks to the availability of cheap, easy-to-use computers like the ZX Spectrum here, a generation of youngsters started programming quirky games with a distinctively British sense of humour. Titles like the Grange Hillam Up School Days, in which you played a naughty boy, or the Python-esque platform game Manic Miner, or the groundbreaking 3D Explorathon Night Law. By the 90s, games had become so popular TV couldn't ignore them, and shows like Games Master thrilled millions with its heady blend of gladiatorial gaming combat and celebrity cameos. And charming sequences in which nervous Kitty Winks begged Sir Patrick Moore's Games Master for assistance in the manner of Oliver Twist anxiously requesting additional gruel. Next. Hello, Games Master. Oh, just get on with your question, please, young man. On European club soccer on the Mega Drive, I can't get enough power into my kicks. What should I be doing? The success of Games Master led to similar programmes like Games World on Sky, a sort of cheap spin-off in which people had to take on these ridiculously titled videators. Here we see Dave the Games Animal Perry taking on Big Boy Barry in a game of Street Fighter 2, very much my generation's equivalent of John Lennon and Bob Dylan jamming together in Abbey Road Studios. Let's play! Oh, once again, Barry over on the right playing Chun-Li, and Dave is over on the left with Giles. Yeah, my generation was a bit stupid, really. Big boy, Barry! Hey! Still, if TV shows featuring commercially available games weren't brilliant, shows featuring completely made-up games were even worse. Take the scarcely remembered Cyberzone, in which Craig Charles looked on as various contestants battled in unconvincing, clunky, tedious and baffling virtual reality games controlled by walking on the spot like you really needed a piss. It wasn't a hit. Now, in 2009, even as Pixel Land grows bigger, more exciting and more inventive with each passing nanosecond, games are rarely covered on mainstream TV at all, and when they are, there's still that same degree of snooty disapproval. I hate computer games, never played computer games before, and hopefully we'll never play them again. Well, I think games don't get their due at their best. They're immersive, amusing, entertaining and downright joyful. In a relatively short space of time, they've evolved to become incredibly sophisticated. 
arguably the first video game was this surprisingly smooth tennis sim created on an oscilloscope in an American laboratory in 1958. Take a look at the equivalent contemporary tennis game, something like Virtua Tennis 2009 here, and you can see just how far video games have come. Today there's a bewildering variety of different genres too. There are as many types of video game as there are pebbles on the beach. In fact, there's even a game where you count pebbles on the beach, or there would be if I wasn't lying. What a liar I am! Anyway, to the uninitiated, the different category titles can seem baffling, whereas dweebs like me just like hearing them being discussed. That's why we're going to run through them, starting with this one. Platformer, a game in which a player-controlled character jumps between suspended platforms in order to reach a goal. OK, easy start. Everyone knows what a platform game is, apart from maybe dead people. Arguably, the first platform game was Nintendo's Donkey Kong in 1982, in which Mario, known then only as Jumpman, had to jump over barrels and prance between girders in order to impress a lady. At their best, trad platform games were essentially little living cartoons, sometimes explicitly so, as in Tiny Toon Adventures here, or Ken Chan and Kato Chan, a weirdly scatological title for the PC Engine with an odd emphasis on blowing off and turds and toilets and farts. Platformers have also been a good launch pad for characters such as Sonic the Hedgehog scene here, rolling at high speed through a jolly cartoon world just like real hedgehogs don't. But it's Mario who's the undisputed king bitch in Platform Prison, appearing in addictive, brilliantly designed games like Super Mario Bros. 1 and 3, the groundbreaking Super Mario 64 which brought the third dimension to platform games with stunning confidence, and most recently the downright psychedelic Super Mario Galaxy titles. Shoot 'em up, a game in which the player avoids attacks while shooting enemies, usually in two dimensions. Shoot 'em ups, or shmups for short, range from the famous Spartan killing grounds of Space Invaders to the cartoonish idiocy of Parodius. Shoot 'em ups aren't as big as they used to be, although they still have a hardcore following amongst masochistic maniacs who actively enjoy dipping into titles like Perfect Cherry Blossom, which sort of resembles a firework display being sick. But at any rate, shoot 'em ups are not to be confused with the following. First Person Shooter, a 3D weapon-based combat game viewed from the protagonist's vantage point. Yes, shooting people in the face is something that never truly loses its magic. The earliest first person games for the home were basic flick screen affairs such as 3D Monster Maze on the ZX81, the first 3D game for any home computer, and it was surprisingly frightening despite its spartan visuals and complete lack of sound. And it was scary partly because at the time, seeing through the eyes of your character was a total novelty. Consequently, this man really believes he is in the maze, that the dinosaur really is after him. Don't you! I'm a dinosaur, you wuss! Of course, the other thing that made 3D Monster Maze scary is that, unlike me, Pussy Boy here doesn't have a gun to defend himself with. No, he'd have to wait at least ten years for that until the Nazis invaded. Suck it. <laughs> no, don't. Yes, yeah, skip forward a decade and Wolfenstein 3D turns up on the PC. It was groundbreaking in its day for its fast-paced, dark humour and extreme violence, including a bit where you got to kill Hitler. Of course, now it's so flipping basic you can get it on the iPhone, where ironically it's so engrossing you won't notice people sneaking up behind you and shooting you in their head. But if Wolfenstein was the pioneer, the following year Doom became the popularizer. It placed the action in a unique gothic sci-fi environment and it was gorier and most importantly of all it had atmosphere. It may look like a simple bang-bang shooty affair, but in fact, above all, Doom was terrifying, like a horror movie. From there on in, a torrent of first-person shooters erupted, including stone-cold classics like Goldeneye and the sprawling sci-fi loveliness of the Halo series. Today's gamer has hundreds of first-person shooters to choose from, including a recent remake of the very first one. Yes, welcome to Wolfenstein 2009, or Willkommen außen Wolfenstein 2009, as the Nazis would say, I'm a tit. It's set in 1943, and you play an American hero called BJ Blazkowicz, although you might as well be a bit of rag on a stick for all the difference it makes. The setup is pretty standard stuff for a first person shooter. You've got some vaguely authentic World War II weapons, and you set about unrelentingly slaughtering members of the Third Reich without a care for their families. Although I like to spice things up by imagining their backstories. Uh, this is uh, Kurt, he's a dad of three. That's Christmas f for your kids. This is Henning, he's got a sweetheart back home who's gonna be missing him. It's alright, he's a Nazi. As we all learned in documentaries like Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Nazis weren't just uniformed retro anti-Semites, no, they were also well into the occult and the 
Nazis in Wolfenstein aren't any different. Anyway, it's not just the Nazis who go all magic, it's also you, or rather BJ Blazkowicz, the dick you're having to be. Early on, BJ finds a magic amulet thing that gives him special abilities, like the ability to access a sort of alternate reality called the Veil, which looks like a sort of 1940s version of Tron. He's also got the power to slow down time, so he can shoot Nazis in the neck in slow motion. Like this. It all looks pretty enough, in as much as an occult rerun of World War II can look pretty, and the game isn't bad, it's just not hugely exciting or innovative. The mix of realistic weapons and mystical silliness is a bit weird, and the World War II shooter is an oversubscribed genre that's been done better before. The Nazis are a bit of a pain in the arse as well, to be honest. They spend most of their time just spouting stupid Nazi catchphrases, which makes it feel a bit like you've just gone berserk on the set of Allo Allo, which would have made for a more interesting game. Because the game is set up with a vague nod to open world scenarios, you have to spend a lot of time wandering around in between missions, endlessly retracing your steps in a depressing little town looking for jobs to do. It's like living in Stoke. And you have to have loads of conversations with all these really boring, humorless members of the resistance, which means you end up sympathising with the Nazis. Agent Blaskovitz, the device you discovered in the hospital basement is the Thule Portal. I always find myself doing the same thing when I'm faced with a boring conversation in games like this. I just sort of wander pointlessly around the room and look from side to side while they're talking. Or sometimes just jump up and down pointlessly. And what are you going to do? Talk the Nazis to death? Anyway, call me a fusty old man, but I think the original Wolfenstein had some humour to it and some charm. Whereas this is just a game in which you find yourself fighting off the Nazis and deja vu. Sometimes with an axe.